Growing up, it's like, do you join a gang or do you not? Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't realise they join gangs because of identity, because it makes you feel safe. Mm -hmm. The people we were defending maybe should have gone to jail. I've survived the darkest period of my life already. Mm -hmm. So nothing else can faze me. No one wants a bodyguard that keeps knocking people out everywhere they go. You've never met me. And if you have met me, I'm not your enemy. You don't, you know. But I am now the barrier between you and whatever you thought you were going to do. Past, present, future episode 37. Past, present, future episode. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so we're here with Ollie Johnson, aka Henchy. Yes, sir. Um, so I wanted to ask you actually at the very beginning, and the reason I want to ask you this is due to the protection and the. Oh, really? So you Carol. haven't told them your name, sir? Oh, of course, yeah. Laurie Wilson. So this is the... Laurie, guys. Don't do that. You're just as important as I am. There we go. Thank you very much, guys. Hey, guys, this is Laurie Wilson. Thank you, bro. Um, yeah, but before we get into it, actually, I'd love to give you the opportunity to kind of like briefly introduce yourself and then. And I can kind of navigate the conversation from there. Cool. Hi, guys. Um, I'm Henchy, and I am Laurie's new BFF. <laughs> if I'm I tell really... you everything, what is he going to ask me? Watch this. We don't know. We don't know yet, <laughs> but let's get into it. So um, yeah, yeah. to go back to the very beginning, yeah. I wanted to talk about your upbringing and location-wise as well. The reason I wanted to ask you what the location was like and what your upbringing was like is yeah. because you're in the protection industry now. For sure. So I wondered, when you were growing up, how important it was to protect yourself? So I'm going to give you an exclusive. I wasn't born in the UK, I was born in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. um, I was born in Lagos, um, and a big up all my Nigerians. Uh, it's a fantastic country, sometimes, but it's not always the safest place. Mm -hmm. um, and... I came here as a, a migrant child, as an asylum seeker child of a migrant. Um, my dad used to um, speak out against injustice in our country and his life was put at risk. Mm -hmm. um, and what sorts of situations? So this is, this is a recent discovery for me uh, in terms of when, you know, my reflective moments. Um, I don't think it's absolutely what has led me to where I am now, but it might play a part in me having what I call hero syndrome because I want to protect people. Mm. But growing up, um, people were trying to harm. I, I'd go as far as say maybe kill my dad. Hmm. Um, How exposed that way? Men with guns came to our house. So he wasn't at home. Uh, myself, my brother, my sister, my mum. Um, had to face a really, um, really scary situation where armed men forced their way into our house and um, where is he type thing. But I was young, you know, you don't really, you, you, you just go through the, the moment. Um, so not long after that, you know, we, we came to the UK and... What was it like when you came to the UK in terms cold. of how alien was it? was it? cold in the UK. Nigeria is a very hot place, but I was just like, it's cold. Mm. Um, and obviously the culture is really different. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a big shock. Um, how hard was it to adapt to the, the lifestyle? The adapting wasn't hard. Per se. So <laughs> even though I lived in the UK, the UK only existed outside of our home. Mm -hmm. My house was still Nigeria, mm -hmm. but the UK is when you walk out. Mm -hmm. um, so I was living in two cultures at the same time. And I guess then the challenge we had, um, you know, between for us and our parents was trying to merge the two, mm -hmm. you know, from their perspective and ours. And I don't know if you know much about Nigerian households, but they're, they're, your typical Nigerian household is very academically driven, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. very religious, um, very cultural. Yeah. Um, but here was I who, <laughs> who now, I'm in an environment where children call their parents by their first name mm -hmm. or might say things like shut up to their parents. How would that go don't, down don't do, don't, It won't go down. Don't be crazy. I wouldn't be alive <laughs> if that happened in my house. 
Um, so, but j- just trying to trying to balance because um, I don't want to. I'm glad about where I come from, and I mm. love what our culture is about. I, I never want to lose that. I embrace it. I'm teaching my children the same thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm not going to ignore where I am. There are really good aspects of Western culture mm-hmm. and English culture. Um, clearly, there's some things that I definitely don't need and I don't want. Um, and it's been interesting trying to balance the two, um, you know, growing up. Mm. But then you see the need for, um, for, for protection in so many aspects of, of normal life. Growing up, it's like, do you join a gang or do you not? Mm-hmm. A lot of people don't realize they join gangs because of identity, because it makes you feel safe. Mm-hmm. Because I know, should I get into a situation, these 16 other guys should back me up. Mm-hmm. That's a security decision that you've made without realizing. And what decision did you make? I did not join. I couldn't join a gang. What? Your gang, so in my house, your gang has to be uh, God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Mm. Um, and you mentioned academia as well, like being driven on academia. So I know from doing the research and, and watching your interviews, you, mm-hmm. you have that legal background of, I think, three years, roughly. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask you about that and how much of that decision was yours? Yeah. How much of it was your parents and how you, how you felt <laughs> about it? Um, how much of it was mine? I, want, I wanted to make my parents happy. Mm-hmm. But... Then, but naturally, you want to do well for yourself anyway. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, so in terms of prioritizing your parents' happiness, how much of that does it take away from your own happiness? So you, you I don't think you realize the lines are blurred as you grow up because your parents guide you into some decisions up until a certain time. Mm-hmm. Not everyone has the presence of mind to know that this is not my decision per se. All right, here's the thing. You have options, right? Mm-hmm. You go to the shop. Um, <clears throat> you can have a tea or a coffee. Mm-hmm. You didn't get to decide that your options were going to be tea or coffee. But when you go into the shop, you're only choosing tea or coffee. Mm-hmm. Cool. That's kind of what it's like growing up in a Nigerian home. So they, you're presented these options that you didn't get to choose. Mm-hmm. But you choose one of them. So it's usually you're going to be a doctor, a lawyer, or, uh, an accountant, or mm-hmm. an engineer. Um, I went for the the lawyer option but I liked it because by our cultural society standards a lawyer is a good profession Mm -hmm. is a respectable profession Um, and so because you want to do well in life that's a decision I've made Mm -hmm. I'm going to do this Um, so it's not until like things happen you're like I'm not actually doing this for me Mm -hmm. you know Um, and when did you make that decision? (sighs) I didn't make a decision to, I made the realization after my mum died that this isn't really about me. Um, I made the decision to switch a few years later. Um, My moral conscious, my moral compass kicked Mm. in um, on a couple of cases. Um, But Mm. obviously for for legal reasons, I can't discuss them. we had moments where I would argue, Your Honor, <laughs> that the people we were defending maybe should have gone to jail. Hmm. And I, I couldn't do that anymore. So, um, yeah, that, that wasn't working for me. But I'm a people person and I want to help people. Mm. And I want to help people sometimes that have made mistakes. Because mm. um, that's what human, that's just a human trait. You will get things wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, it's interesting you mentioned about being a people person. So it's one of the things that I've actually written down because I think your friend described you as a people person and <laughs> pushed you in the direction of becoming a, a bodyguard. I don't want to butcher the name. Shana? Shane. 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 Because my friend makes it sound like I've just got one friend. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, I actually have four. <laughs> um, no, Shane, rest in peace, Shane. I love you. Um, Shane, Shane changed my life without realizing. 
So he he asked me to come and do the close protection course with him. Mm. And um, he's so annoying. <laughs> um, and I was just like, no, you're, like, you're an adult, go and do it by yourself. What? Mm. And I was like, come, 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 badgering me. So I went and I did it. And um, this is actually funny. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shout this guy's name. Uh, shout out Steve. Steve was the course director. And um, Steve said to us, Imagine this, we're we're a bunch of new recruits. Steve said, most of you aren't going to make it. (laughs) First day, yeah, yeah. first day. Most of you aren't going to make it. You don't have what it takes. Shane's like this. (laughs) I'm like, how dare you? Do you know who we are? Mm. Um, 10 years or almost 10 years on, I realized what he meant and actually Shane and I would have been the only, well, Shane's passing us off, I'm the only one of Mm, that group mm. that's actually a fully fledged close protection operator. Mm -hmm. And that's insane. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's so many hurdles to it. And 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 now I get why he said it. Mm -hmm. So big up you, Steve, for being honest with Mm. us. But so I was on the course with Shane. Um, We got through it. I had a job. I was just doing this for, I was just being a good friend. Mm. So I was going to go back to work. And Shane was like, no, we should do, like, you're a people's person. Mm. You do the people stuff, I'll do the admin. Mm. Um, I was like, whatever, just leave me alone. Um, and then we began, and I was like, yo, I come, one, I'm really good at this. Two, I really enjoy it. Mm-hmm. I, I get to fuse all the aspects of my life that I really enjoy. Um, and it, it helps me achieve something that matters to me, which mm-hmm. is a keeping people safe. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to ask you actually a little bit about the keeping people safe. And the reason is, and firstly, I'm so sorry for the losses and thank you for, for mm-hmm. uh, going into them. But yeah. how did you process the loss of your mum and, and Shane? And the reason I'm asking is I want to know after those losses, how much does that enhance your want to protect people because you've, you've suffered those losses? Um, let's do it in stages. So mum, I, I was a mummy's boy. Um, so uh, mum's... My mum died through illness, so she had breast cancer. Um, and so there's nothing I can do, I can physically do about that. Mm. Um, um, and because I was a mummy's boy, that was my Achilles heel. I, 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 would, I was really good at not getting in trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, but I used to lose my, you just can't talk about my mum. Mm-hmm. Sometimes that still affects me now. Mm. Like I just leave leave mums out of it in mm. general. Um, and I had to remind myself there was nothing I could do. Um, so mum's passing, that loss I used more as motivation. That was probably the darkest part of my life. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's two things I use that for. One is when I'm really down in a bad place, because that will happen. I don't know uh, if, I want you guys to know this. Mm. Dark places and and testing times are a consistent part of your life. It will come again and again. You need to find a way to deal with them. You need to discover what works for you really early on, because that will help you through. Anyway. My go-to was always, or is always, I've survived the darkest period of my life already. Mm. So nothing else can faze me. It might hurt, I might be rattled, um, it might be really hard, but nothing is harder for me than, I was 20 when my mom died. Mm. That was the only person I confided in, that was the Mm. only person I listened to, per se. So nothing's harder than that for me. I don't care. I, I don't care who you are. I agree. So uh, that, that's the first thing that I used that for. And then the second thing was, 
I really need to make her proud. Mm-hmm. Um, when my time is up, I want them to say that Sade's son did this. Mm-hmm. Um, and those two things are key for me. And I, you know, that's how I use mm-hmm. uh, the passing of my mom. That's how I deal with that. Shane is a little bit different because the relationship with my mom wasn't based on me. I didn't get to choose that. Sure. My friendship with Shane, Shane was my choice. Um, and as friendships go, especially with guys, your friends can be annoying, will be annoying. Um, and, you know, he had his own issues um, closer to the time of his passing. And I blamed myself afterwards sometimes because I was like, maybe I could have, I should have answered a few more of his calls. Um, you know, closer to when he passed. Um, so he he went missing before he, you know, we 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 found he his body was found in a, a river. Mm. Um, we we had been searching for him for uh, some time, and you know he had things going on in his life leading up to that. Um, you can kind of, in the moment, you do the be- or you do the best you can. Sometimes, with, with hindsight, you think I could have done more, or maybe you say I should have done more. Mm-hmm. But actually, maybe in that moment, you you have to be honest with yourself and say, "Well, I did do the best I could, or I didn't." Mm-hmm. Um, and sometimes I think I did, and sometimes I think I didn't. But Shane's loss tells me two things. One, how much he's changed my life. Like genuine, I am an, I'm, in, I'm an international CP. I've seen and done so much because of a decision mm-hmm. to, to sit down and do a course with my friend. Um, and now I travel the world and, and I'm doing what I love. So, um, Affect someone else's life positively where you can, you mm-hmm. know, follow, follow that dream, make that decision, whatever. He didn't know that he'd turn my life around like mm-hmm. that. So that's the first thing. Um, the second thing about dealing with Shane's losses, I don't know if I have dealt with it. So I'm trying to do, <clears throat> I'm trying to achieve so much in the security industry so I can say, yo, Shane, look what you did. Mm. Um, a lot of people have impacted my life. But in terms of my career path, mm-hmm. it is a direct result of my relationship with Shane. Mm-hmm. And I really want to get to heights where I can just, I don't know if I'll ever be nominated for anything. I don't know if we are, we're ever going to be physically celebrated somehow. But should that day ever come, mm-hmm. I will I call his name everywhere, mm-hmm. you know. Um, and that's kind of how I'm dealing with it. Yeah. I, I have to say dealing with because I I have moments where I'm just like, yeah, like where are you, you know? Um, mm-hmm. But life life does go on, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah, I agree. I think. One thing that I want to say, and thank you for going into it, but but one thing that's so admirable about both of those situations is that you found ways of taking lessons from them and drawing motivation from them to to improve the the current part of your life, which I think is so important because, unfortunately, people's lives are filled with with tragic events. No matter who you are, to to some degree, you're going to go through things like that. So what's important is that you manage, you deal with, as you put it, but also you try and draw things which can positively affect the future, um, which is something that you've done. So thank you for that and, and thank you for going into it. And I kind of wanted to to tie up the past section with understanding, look, what lessons have you learned through past experiences? And we, we've perfectly covered that off. So I did want to ask you a little bit about the the present. So mm. obviously from, from looking through your plethora of 
A-list star clients. Um, so Stormzy, Dave, mm. Wizkid, Burner Boy, Migos to list off a few. And I know most recently Thames, as you were saying. Mm. Um, I wanted to ask you, why you? Why do they choose you when there's... Because I'm the best. <laughs> That's it. Genuinely. This is after um, what is the best why, why me? Um, the security industry is a trust industry. Mm. Um, long gone are the days where you just have to be massive. Long gone are the days where you have to be expert in 16 martial arts and know how to shoot a gun, mm. eyes closed. Only. Long gone are the days where you only have to be seven foot. The role is now a combination, a balanced combination of look, knowledge, expertise, um, customer service, uh, legal know-how, um, cultural know-how, um, um, societal mm. know-how. You are no good to a client if you don't understand the rules in a Muslim country when the client frequents that place. Mm. You are no good to a client if you don't know the, behavior, the etiquette of um, the arts environment. Mm. If that person frequents the arts, you are no good to a client if you don't understand the rules on the water, if that person loves to go yachting. Mm. It's not enough to just be able to knock someone out with one punch. Because actually, no one wants, to, no one wants a bodyguard that keeps knocking people out everywhere they go. Mm. People won't invite you out. Because <laughs> everywhere you go, someone gets knocked out. <laughs> Um, so I would like to think, um, me because for the best part, I'm well balanced. Mm. Um, it's interesting what you're saying about knocking people out, because I mean, if I'm to reference it to like a football situation, which is more what I'm familiar with, mm. they often say that the best defenders, the best centre backs, they're never there doing yeah. big slide tackles because they're prepared for the situation. They've already 100%. sorted it out. So I think in this scenario, if I'm to understand it, what you're saying is an effective bodyguard is someone that's already sorted out the situation so they don't have to knock people out. Correct. If you as a centre back, take someone down in the box and you give a penalty, you've had a bad day. Even if they miss that penalty, the fact that you've ended up in that situation has exposed you, right? Mm. Cool. Equally, the role is so... No one notices the defence until something goes wrong. Mm. Everyone's so focused on the strikers and the midfielders because that's where the play is because um, they score the goals. The defence only comes under the spotlight when a goal goes in, mm. that's unfair. Defenders mm. do a great job of keeping the opposition out, but actually you're only criticised um, when a goal scored. Mm. So you get no glory, even though you've done 90 minutes of hard work as well. Mm. And that's what it's like being a bodyguard. No one cares or no one notices because nothing happened. But nothing happened because I was there and I've done my job. Mm -hmm. Now, should something happen, the first thing they say, where was security? And now you're exposed. Mm. Um, so it's, I, I definitely would like to think that um, preparation and awareness is everything. Mm -hmm. um, but don't, don't come into this line of work if you're looking for glory. Mm. This isn't about, and yes, people say that's easy for me to say. I didn't, I, I, so I've been told now that apparently I'm a brand. My brand isn't solely, no, it's not even reliant on me being a bodyguard. I'm a brand because I'm funny. Mm -hmm. I'm a brand because I'm strong. I've done my own stunts. I lift cars. That's cool to people. Mm -hmm. um, that probably even helps me get work sometimes. Yeah, I want the guy that lifts a car. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, it's not like I'm ever going to have to lift the client's car. Sure. But should that situation <laughs> present itself, well I'm, I am willing to do it. Um, so 
don't do this. My, my work isn't, or, or the role, the work can make you popular depending on who you're looking mm. after, but the role isn't a glorious one. Don't come into this looking for glory. Mm. Um, but be balanced. Yeah, yeah, no, it's really be interesting. Balanced. So thank you for uh, tying into that analogy. Um, mm. Perfect for those out there like me that understand football, but potentially not, <laughs> not bodyguarding. But it's funny, actually, you mentioned the glory. And mm. I guess this might actually tie into that. But I did want to ask you, because you are quoted saying, and, and you said it earlier, that you enjoy saving people's lives, yes. which to me, if I'm to read into it, implies mm. that there have been some life-threatening situations that you've been through. So I wanted to ask you, what, what do some of those situations look like? Um, I'm trying to think of stories I could tell you about without. Um, so unfortunately, I mean, some things I can't talk about just because uh, I don't only protect people safety, but I protect their privacy. So some things I can't talk about. Um, I think something I've already talked about on a, on a different platform was like an incident where, which wasn't, I wasn't bodyguarding directly, but it's a security incident. I was at a venue um, and I, you know, I was at the front door, I've searched everyone, blah, blah, blah. Later on, everyone's running out screaming. He's got a gun. He's got a gun. I've run inside and I've turned the corner and I'm facing a uh, Mac 10. Front, like, not like he's over there. I've turned the corner. The gun is in my face. Um, this is a submachine gun, by the way. Um, so, and then the guy's like, what are you going to do, big man? <laughs> and it sounds, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm laughing now, but <laughs> there was nothing to laugh about. Mm. I was like, nothing. In my head, I'm so, so also, without this gun, I would fold this individual in half really easily. Um, but here I am looking at the barrel of this gun. So I'm like, um, what are you doing? I'm going to go outside and I'm going to call the police. That's what I'm going to do. Um, and I'll be honest, in that moment, I did make a mistake. I will say this. In that moment, I turned around. I turned my back to a live firearm. Don't ever do that. Never turn your back on a live. I should have walked away backwards. But in the pressure of the moment, I turned around um, and I started walking. The minute I turned, I was like, what are you thinking? Um, so to kind of mitigate, psychologically to mitigate that moment, I started saying the Lord's Prayer out loud. Mm. Bearing in mind, we're in a, a, we're in a club environment. Um, obviously the lights are on now, the music mm. has stopped. I'm walking away from a light. This guy has a gun out. Half the venues run out screaming, whatever. And I'm saying the Lord's Prayer out loud. Um, well, clearly he didn't shoot. <laughs> Um, he, so also, also, here's another thing. He wasn't, I mean, no one goes out, unless you have a personal beef. So here's another thing. If you're ever thinking of getting into the industry, you can't have personal beefs because now you're a liability. So just get that. Let's get that. So unless you have a personal beef, nobody actually hates me. Mm. You might not like me saying no to you, but you're not interested. When you left your house, you weren't thinking about me. You just wanted to get into the club or you wanted to get into the VIP section next to the star you love or you wanted to, whatever it is. You've never met me. And if you have met me, I'm not your enemy. You don't, you know, but I am now the barrier between you and whatever you thought you were going to do. Mm. So in this moment, I'm your opposition, but I'm not your enemy. Um, and I will always play to that because I know we don't have an issue. Mm. Um, so I just, just went outside. Um, and if, luckily, as I said, nothing, he, you know, he didn't set it off or whatever. Um, it's interesting you say about no one hates me, no one hates me and stuff like that because... I'm sure someone does. <laughs> no one hates me enough to want to fight. Understood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. But the reason I specified is from my perspective anyway, mm. and I think also on social media and stuff like that, bodyguards are, are probably looked at in a bad light to, to be transparent. I don't think a lot of people would look at a bodyguard and be like, oh, I, I love that guy, or, or particularly, <laughs> particularly bouncers as well. Yeah, I think maybe, maybe more bouncers mm. than bodyguards. 
Bodyguards really don't have a profile. Mm. I've kind of looked around. Name me three bodyguards. You might, there's every chance you know the name of the local head doorman mm. wherever you live mm. or wherever you frequent. Mm. Um, so bodyguards in general don't have a profile. Um, bouncers have way more of a reputation mm. uh, because they're kind of seen as, they're, they're more the face of the security industry. Um, and bouncers either are, they're like mama, you have a love them or you hate them. Everyone's determined in their mind that most bouncers used to be bullied at school and now they've gone, they've got juiced up, gone to the gym and now they're ready to dish it out to everyone else. Or you're just the job's worth, let me and my mates in, even though we're half an hour past the last entry time, Mm -hmm. even though we're drunk or even though we're drugged up. Um, Stop being a party pooper. Um, But it's just, you know, it's not true. Of course there are terrible bouncers. There are terrible everything. Mm -hmm. Um... And it's unfair to paint paint everyone with the same brush. But again, as I said, if you're a great bouncer or you're a great bodyguard, you can't get any glory mm, mm. because it just means you've allowed people to get on with their fun in the safest way. They've enjoyed your company. You've enjoyed theirs. It's quick. The exchange is done. They, have, they remember the good time that they had. No one will, what's the name of the last person that served you at Tesco or Audi or wherever you shop? If they were great and they really, you know, they really got you through mm. the tills quick, that's great for you. The experience was quick and that's what matters to you, mm. not the person. Mm. Should you have an incident at the till, I bet you'd remember her name. Mm, 100%. And that's what it's like. And with that experience in mind, I wanted to ask you a little bit about how hard you work because off camera we were talking about, look, you can get a call and you need to be here within X amount of time and there's, there's kind of no two ways about it. So mm. how hard do you work? And the reason I'm interested in this is because I want to know how the hard work affects personal relationships. Mm. Ooh. Go on, Laurie. Okay, check this out. If you are... Big up, big whiz. Um, I... Whiz kid, for those. Yeah, yeah, sorry. For those of you who don't know, yeah, I call him big whiz. That's a whiz kid. Um, uh, I'm fortunate to look after big whiz in the UK and in Europe. Um... And so he's the number one art, Afrobeats artist in the world. Mm-hmm. I'm going to say that again. Number one Afrobeats artist in the world. So, and I'm not comparing them. I'm just saying for, for those who might not know, context is that's our, that's our Drake. Mm. That's our Ed Sheeran. Mm. That's, I say our, but we're crossing, Afrobeats is now crossing over into different cultures. Yeah, so, you know, whatever. But for context, in case... You wanted to make a comparison to see how huge it is. Um, if you were looking after Adele mm. and Adele said, I need to go out in an hour, meet me here. What are you going to do? I'm going to meet her there. You're going to meet her there. Probably 10 minutes early. And if Adele says, oh, it should only be for a couple of hours, but then when she gets there, she'll be like, I'm going to stay for 11 more hours. What are you going to do? Stay for You're going hours. to stay for 11 more hours. That's the job. Now, it doesn't help if, say, you have a partner at home or children and you said, oh, that is just going for a couple of hours. When I get back in two hours, in in four hours time, we're going to go to the park. You've now found out you're not leaving. Mm. You're not going to the park. If you're fortunate, you might get a chance to send a text or make a call really quickly to say sorry and I'll make it up to you. If you're not, you just have to wait and you have to figure it out. So let me go back to Steve. I'm going to link this. So let me go back to Steve who told us that we weren't going to make it. Steve also said, if you want to have a family, don't do this job. At the time, I had just gotten married when I, I did my course. And in my interview, Steve was like, how do you feel about being divorced? And I was like, this guy's so rude. How dare you? Um, he said, I'm on my third divorce. And I was like, you're a bad decision maker. <laughs> so I can't take you seriously. 
Because if you made them, if you got it wrong the first time, the second time, just stop getting married, mm. bro. Um, he, I get it now. So, whether it's your wife, your girlfriend, um, whether it's your husband, mm. whatever. People like people doing what they say they're going to do. If you say you're going to be home in four hours, please be home in four hours. Now, everyone can be as understanding as they want to be. But if there is a consistently you saying, I'm coming home in four hours, but you come home 16 hours later, eventually... Mm. it's going to cause friction. If you are meant to go away internationally for two to three days, and that turns into 10 days, eventually, mm. it's going to cause friction. And how does that make you feel about the job? I love my job. I found, I'm, I'm fortunate to be doing what I love to do. How I feel about the job will not change. How I feel about how it affects those who I care about, that's a bad feeling. Um, you will sacrifice personal moments. Mm. I've missed really important dates in the lives of people I care about. Would I like to have been there? Yes. Um, What's a moment that sticks out? I mean, I don't think, I don't think anyone is more greater than the other sometimes, depending on who it is. So, all right, say for instance, all right, say all my birthday for the last nine years, uh, eight years, I've been working. Mm. I've worked every single birthday for the last eight years. I was away with a client on my son's birthday this year. Now, my son, hi, Ezra. My son turned six. Daddy's boy loves his dad. Daddy, my birthday this time ever. I'm really sorry. I'm not going to be here. And I'm honest with my kids. I tell them the truth because it's hard enough that I'm not always going to physically going to be around. Mm. So I want you to know that I'm going to always be open and honest with you. Um, one, it's a safety thing. So, you know, God forbid... God forbid, should I be in X, Y, Z country and there's an issue in that country, you can, f oh, daddy's there, right? We should check if he's okay. You know, that's one thing. But two, also, you know that I have every intention. I don't want you to find out later on, oh, but dad, you lied about that. Mm. The minute you, you've been found out to have lied about something, I'd rather, oh, daddy, you disappointed us on that day because you didn't turn up, but not you lied. So um, I wasn't there for my son's birthday. I want to be there for my son's birthday. Um, but I have to protect these people. Mm -hmm. And that in turn pays me. Mm -hmm. That allows me to provide you a life that I think you deserve. Mm. Um, That balance is hard. Mm -hmm. And if I'm honest, if you're going to be a really good CP, that balance will never exist. If you're going to be a, if you're going to be a thriving, be, think about this, if you're ever considering going, the security industry is wide. You can have that type of balance if you do events, mm. if you do clubs. I could work eight hours, at the same pub or the same club or, or a Tesco or a diamond shop or whatever, these are your hours. You do that six days a week, Bob's your uncle. If you want to be a bodyguard, forget about it. There is no structure to your life through your clients. Mm -hmm. What happens when, say you're with musicians, what happens when they go on tour? Mm -hmm. A world tour, a proper world tour is a minimum of five months. What are you going to do? 
mm-hmm. say to the client, yeah, I'm just going to pop back to the UK. They might allow it. You can't, some people allow you to negotiate certain things. Some, you, you might have to, at some point, maybe negotiate with them or take out your own money, fly your family over to meet you somewhere mm-hmm. where you get a rest day or a couple of rest days, whatever. You have to figure out what works for you. But, but the job comes first. Mm-hmm. That's harsh, bro. Mm-hmm. It is. That is really hard. I've been on jobs on the anniversary of my mom's passing. I can't say to the client, oh, I'm going to be a little bit emotional today. I've been on jobs when I get phone calls, my daughter's not feeling well. Your son's not feeling well. Their mum's not feeling well. So anything can happen at any time when Mm. you're not there. Mm. It's even worse for someone who's so into being the victor or the protector or what do you do? Mm. So that's, that's it's tough. It's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, there's no bad, it's yeah. so tough. With that in mind, and to tap into the future, to kind of round the conversation off, mm. what is the goal for you for the future? Oh, I want to, I am the self-proclaimed ambassador of the security industry. I am the whole PR company, I'm the marketing agency. I don't like the way we're looked at. Mm-hmm. Or even better, I don't like the way we're not looked at. Mm-hmm. I've, I found out that, I, I used to say this um, uh, on, on interviews, and I found out it really rattled some people. So I'm going to keep saying it. So the security industry is the unofficial extension of the police force. We, ha- we, we have a similar role, but we have none of the resources and none of the respect, if the police are respected. People respect the uniform. People don't give any type of respect to the security industry. But we're supposed to protect you Mm -hmm. like the police. We're supposed to help enforce the rules like the police. Mm. People at least in some way fear the police uniform or the police authority because there are consequences like, A, being arrested, going to jail. People really think they can have a row with security, physically be violent, and nothing's gonna happen. So we're at such a disadvantage. Mm. Um, however, should you get into a situation with someone else, you run to us. Like every day, here's the thing, our job is to put ourselves in harm's way for you. So that's for you, for this gentleman here, for anybody else that might come into this establishment if we were in one. Let's say there's 10 of us. And there's 800 people in here. 10 of us are supposed to put ourselves, it's just an example, Mm. in harm's way for all 800 of you. None of you are going to turn around at the end of the night and say, you guys were great. If you all have a good time and no one gets hurt and there's no fight, or if there is a fight and we stop it, we save the day, blah, blah, blah. None of you are going to remember us. Mm. You're going to remember the people who fought. Mm. No one ever thinks, ooh, I, want, I really hope those guys are getting the money they deserve. I've done 20-hour days sometimes on my feet. Imagine being in an environment where every single person is having fun but you. The music's great. The people seem great. The drinks are flowing. Some environments, maybe the drugs are flowing. The food seems exquisite. The vibes are A1. What does that mean to you? Absolutely nothing. You have to be aware all the time. You have to be alert all the time. I have a water and a Red Bull, please. How do you financially measure that? Who cares? When was the last time someone cared? How are you, mate? You all right? I'm sure there are people that have checked on security now and then, whatever. Um, but no one ever looks at the risk we take. Mm. And it is a risk. So. Going back to what is the goal in the future? I've been asking clients this. Say for instance, you say, oh, Henshi, how much is it to have you with me? It costs this much. Oh, come on, bro. Can't I pay this? Let's say you said to me, can't I pay you 300 pounds for the day? So for a 10 hour day, that's 30 pounds an hour. 
This is just an example. Mm -hmm. Here's my question. The 60 minutes in an hour. Are you telling me that the value of your life over the next hour is 30 quid? You're a successful entertainer, sports person, mm. whatever. You're a successful podcaster. Let's assume you have a really nice chain under your shirt, whatever. Even if you have no jewelry, mm. just the people that care about you. Your podcast is so successful, but there are some controversial things that's been said. So not everyone's happy. And some people might want to tell you about it. You don't want that hassle. You're just really popular. You just want to go to the shop without 16 people asking you for a picture because you're not in the mood. Whatever. Is the value of your comfort, your safety, your peace of mind. Imagine you just want to have a little excitement that no one needs to know about. Your brand doesn't allow you to do, to publicly have recreational drugs. And you want to. So now I have to cover you from being seen. Someone wants to take a picture of you out with a woman who's just helping you carrying your shopping. But it looks like because her hair's a bit rough, because the wind was blowing, mm. it looks like something just happened. I have to figure out a way to not let that picture happen. Is that worth 30 quid over the next hour? Now, let's just say you do have a quarter of a million pounds worth of jewelry, which some people do that I'm with. The insurance alone is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. You're telling me, if people wanted to take that from you, that's only worth 30 quid an hour. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Cool. So that's, so that's the mission. So the mission is I'm rebranding how we look because what we do is not easy. What we do is risky. Yes, it's a decision that we've made, but in the same vein, it, uh, the decisions police officers make, nurses make, and mm. they're all underpaid. So, but they have to fight their own battles. I'm not here to fight for them. Guys, I have so much respect for people in the military. What a crazy idea, like, you give away your life so that we, and we will never know what you go through, so that we can comfortably enjoy our freedoms. They deserve so much more. You can't measure that financially. But if you're going to give them something, please make, make it something substantial. Mm. Um, and as I said, it's not a role that's glorious. We're never going to get glory. Mm. So at least compensate us where the people that we are uh, looking after, it's not a substitute, but it helps. Mm -hmm. Daddy's got, I, I haven't seen my dad or my mom, there are female bodyguards. I haven't seen my mom for a month. He's away at work, she's away at work. Mm. I oh, can't wait till they get back. When he gets back, we're going to. Or oh, my daddy sent me a bike. Or mm. you know, um, you can't do that on the ridiculous wages I've heard some people are being paid. Mm. Mm. Um, so that's my plan. That's the future, um, and we deserve it. We are worth it because you are worth it. People, when we protect people, we're not just protecting them as individuals. So. Say I allow, say I'm looking after a rapper that, that does gangster rap. My looking after them allows them not to have to get into a violent situation themselves, which means they don't have to go to jail, which means they get to record more music, which means they get to chart more. So not only have I protected them, I've protected the music, I've mm -hmm. protected the talent. I've done more for the label. Mm -hmm. The label gets to mm -hmm. release their music. They're making money. The people get to hear the music, the clubs that the music's being played in, the radio, it, everything is interlinked. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, a, imagine a player, um, who's the number one striker in the world at the moment? Lewandowski, maybe. Cool, let's say him. And let, what team do you support? Arsenal. Good man. So let's say he wants to come to the Emirates and on his Arsenal sign him. He's going to get bumped. People are going to come to the stadium. I want to see Lewandowski. Mm. Cool. But his house gets robbed. Remember when Ozil ha uh, mm. had the incident? Mm. Cool. You have two of those. I don't want to live here anymore. I, I want to transfer. I'm out of it. Of that's great. Don't go in my house. Do not go. My family's there. 
or don't rob me at, at, at gunpoint, knife point in the street. I'm with my, you could be with your friends, your kids, whatever. No one wants that experience. Now they want to leave the club because it's not safe here. That, the knock-on effect for the club's mm. huge. For the boy who's going to go to the stadium at seven and be like, oh my God, I want to be him. He's never going to have that experience because he left mm. because someone wanted to take his watch. Mm. Now that's a bad life decision on their part, but they've made that decision. That could be avoided if he had security. The picture is so much bigger than, than what it originally seems, which, uh, yeah, it's super interesting. It seems like a great place to close out. So I wanted to genuinely thank you for your time. It's been incredible. And um, yeah, how have you found it? I have had the best time. I want you guys to know that I'm going to go and have an iced coffee and I'm not going to tell you what brand, <laughs> but Laurie's really facilitated that for me today and he's the greatest host so far. Thank you, bro. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I'm real.